This is this is this is. What's up, you guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of the Micro Air Podcast. Um, every now and again, I'll be sitting in this chair and it starts squeaking. And so that just happened right before I started this podcast. And I went and I WD 40 the chair. My hands got WD 40 on them. I just, I've been washing my hands furiously. I can barely smell the WD 40. Those that don't know, you got to know WD 40. It's it. it fixes everything really it's like the duct tape of of uh uh substances i don't know what what it what is wd-40 it's like an oil it's a lubricant but uh shout out (laughs) anyway you know what i forgot to grab i forgot to grab my beer hold on hold on Not a good way to start the show <laughs> by leaving right at the top of the show. Um, I hope you're still here with us. I hope you're doing well. Um, with time, daytime. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, brand new episode of the podcast. 179. 170. One, did I say 179? <sighs> That's my life. I get things wrong all the time. It's 379. 379 everybody um cheers to you this is uh this is one of the last few rock on lagers that i have brewed by silver city brewery and crosby hops and it's a charity beer and uh we're happy to be part of uh this campaign it's pretty much done like i think most of the beer is sold out but an article just came out in usa today about rock on lager so uh very proud that uh, it's getting some recognition for doing some great things. And uh, so cheers to you guys. Cheers to Silver City. Cheers to Crosby Hops. Uh, it's been uh, it's been cool getting to know everybody and getting to work with everybody and interact. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Let me take a drink. Mm. Did you hear that? Did you hear the chair? The chair squeaked. All right. I'm going to get settled. I'll try not to squeak the chair. And we're going to have a great, a great episode because your voicemails, your voicemails. I wasn't even going to do a voicemail episode. And then last second, I just was like, you know what? Let me just check the voicemail. Check the trap. Boom. Caught some voicemails. So uh, we'll get to that. I just want to say mxpx.com. We have new merch up right now. Uh, just in time for fall and winter, we have some tank tops. I know it's crazy, um, but better late than never. It's my life story, you know. Uh, but a lot of other cool stuff, magnets and the, the, the you know decals, uh, the whole deal. So t-shirts, magnets, decals, uh, a lot of a lot of cool new stuff. Oh, coffee mugs. We got travel mugs, um, and I think there's a water a water cup too, a water a water bottle. Not this water bottle. This is the water bottle I talked about last week um, that spilled into my backpack. But it's no more incidents like that. I've learned my lesson. Um, I, although I did, I did something else like that just very recently. Maybe it'll come to me, but we don't need to hear hear more about that. I mean, I guess I just got WD forty all over my hands when there was no need for that. That didn't need to happen, but it did. So there's that. Anyway, mxpeaks.com. Thank you so much for your support. Box sets are all out. Everybody that ordered a box set should um, should should be getting one soon. They're on the way. And if you live uh, overseas, you know, thank you so much for your patience. It does take a long time to ship uh, over there. Things are taking longer and longer these days. But I'm so happy, so excited. Box sets are out. Um, I've been spending a lot of hours working on that stuff. And it's not quite done. There's, There's a few, you know, of course, with anything, there's a few bumps and bruises. But, I mean, I gotta say, it... I don't know, I haven't done the math or anything, but let's say we sold, you know, 1,500 of these things, and there is honestly less than 30, less than 30 uh, damaged uh, box sets, really, you know, if I had to add it up, and I'm I'm averaging it out there, but uh, around 30 or less than 30 messed up orders, so I'm really happy with that number, (laughs) and I'm sorry if you're one of those numbers, so sorry. Um, but we are doing what we can to fix any, any issues. And, uh, besides that, 
I mean, just the, the overwhelmingly good news is everybody's getting their box sets. Almost everybody's getting them flawlessly. So uh, it's it's a uh, it's a long a long standing project that is finally finally coming to a close. It's not quite done because uh, you know we're just finishing up a th- few things. And I sent out some of the comps. You know, some of the people that worked on the actual box set with us. I sent those out already as well. So uh, just thank you everybody that worked on it, and thank you everybody that that supported MXPX and and bought one for yourself or for. For somebody you know maybe you bought one for your your friend but uh i i just uh that's a good friend by the way if you bought one for your friend you are a good friend <laughs> all right you guys mm. so that's it box sets uh it's a it was a huge learning curve that uh, just as we were working through it it got it got i wouldn't it got easier i wouldn't say it um it did get easier, you know, and there was new challenges and new things we had to figure out. But uh, along the way, I'm really happy with how everything worked out. So I don't actually have a copy yet of my own, although there are copies in my possession technically, but I haven't like taken one for myself. Um, the band guys still haven't gotten one yet either, but soon, like I've actually, if they came over right now, I'd give them one. Let's, let's put it that way. <laughs> but but yeah, they'll get it next time they come over. Um, so yeah, box sets. Thank you guys. MXPX.com. If you want to be part of this stuff, we will have uh, some projects in the future. And if you want to be in on the ground floor, make sure you sign up to our emailing list. Um, you can go to MXPX.com and do that. Or as well as, or either or, our text list. We have a text list and you can put in your phone number. We'll text you. When we release a new song, when we release, uh, you know, something, we're selling something kind of big like this box set thing, you know, we'll let you know. Um, but uh, we try not to get too crazy. We try to we try to make every post and every uh, email uh, worth worth getting. So hope you guys enjoy that. Um, every now and then I'll, we'll, we'll put in what what's going on with the podcast and stuff up there as well. So. Um, your voicemail is coming up soon. If you want to call in and you have a question about something, if you have a, uh, a question about life in general, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, just call me 360-830-6660. Uh, leave me a voicemail. And if it's good, I'll play it on the, on the podcast. In fact, actually I don't play, I don't pre plan what I'm going to play on the podcast. So I'll just edit later if it's like a terrible question. I'll just take it out. So <laughs> that's exactly what I've been doing. Uh, but uh, for the most part, I have been uh, answering everything that comes comes around, even there when there's like a, a spam call or something like that. <laughs> I'll let it, I'll let it fly. But um, we'll get to that in a second. My mom still cleans my room. Just came out on on uh, <clears throat> on our MXPX YouTube. Uh, for Music Monday, and you know, I had to write up a blurb about that, and I was like, "How do I? How did I even come up with that idea?" Because I don't really remember. That wasn't like a big thing where my mom was cleaning my room all the time. I mean, I'm sure she did, but uh, she doesn't still clean my room. People, you know, I'm just gonna go out there and admit that. But the funny thing is, is uh, I mentioned this in the blurb. My room was also, and this was around. To, I would say junior high, high school, like when I lived at home, I lived, my room was basically at the corner of the house near the kitchen on that kitchen side. And there was a tiny little pantry right there and it just barely, it didn't really hold anything. So there's a shelf inside my room that was actually the pantry. So <laughs> originally my room was sort of an office slash I don't know, like a an office slash uh, pantry, I guess, a food pantry. And then, of course, when my parents moved into that place and and had some had a bunch of kids, it became uh, it became pantry slash Mike's room. And so I'd be in there, and then my mom would just like randomly. I think at some point she would knock, but but you know, she would come in and grab something off the shelf, some food item, and then walk back to the kitchen. 
and I would always be like, what's going on over there? You know, so like never, never any privacy. There was privacy later on in, in my, I think in my high school years, but another fun, fun thing about that room, that was the room that I, I had these delusions of grandeur, these, uh, these big, big fantasies about being in a band, rocking in a band, you know, and I'd, I'd play Brian Adams' Reckless, that whole album, and Summer of 69 is on that album. And then, aside from that, I'd also, also had like a, a Nerf hoop, you know, and I think I started small, started with like, just like a small Nerf hoop, and then, and then I graduated to the big size Nerf hoop. And then I had a big Nerf ball. It was a big blue Nerf ball, like this big. And I think at one point, you know, after a while with those Nerf balls, and I'm just like draining, draining, just boom, boom, boom. Uh, got really good at Nerf ball. I, I was I was on the verge of going pro. If there was a pro league, <laughs> I'd be going pro Nerf basketball. But what happened was after a while with these big Nerf balls is is they, they get chunks taken out of, you know, pulled out of them, you know, just by you grabbing them and and throwing it all the time. So what I did is I ended up taping with like masking tape, white masking tape. I taped around the ball um, a bunch of times, almost like in a, in a basketball pattern. So So it was like I had the seams as tape for my fingers and I could really get a nice spin back spin on that ball and just drain those nerf balls boom boom and I had these scenarios in my head where I was like you know on the pro team you know on a pro team and I was like the superstar like right back then you know Michael Michael Jordan was was you know huge huge star and Hey, my name's Michael as well, so why not? So anyway, I think, uh, you know, I just remember just pretend, you know, being a kid pretending uh, to be a pro basketball player with the Nerf basketball setup. And I got so good at it, and I would do all these crazy dunks. I'd have dunk contests and just see what I could do. Off my bed, boom. You know, just, it, it was fun. You know, and, and now that I think about it, I did that also with um, baseball. I would take uh, I would take golf balls, actually, because golf balls really bounce well. And my, my neighbors at the time had, uh, their garage was just like a cement, like a cinder block wall. And it was just a clear blank wall. And they didn't care if I came over and played. So I was a kid, you know, a little kid probably you know somewhere in elementary school like fourth grade fifth grade somewhere in there and sixth grade into that I was playing baseball and t-ball I went from t-ball to baseball little leagues um, played a, played in junior high for maybe one year I think I played uh, junior varsity baseball but then you know I was getting into music and, and and all that so my younger years was filled with a lot more sports so anyway I would take these these golf balls and I would have my my baseball mitt and I would I would have a bucket of them because we we grew up next to a golf course and uh and, and so I'd go over there and just grab like range, range balls off the golf course and I'd have a bunch of balls so I'd be you know counting down boom you know and if I pitch badly then I would be walking a bunch of batters but I would be the pitcher and I would throw it and I had, you know, a general area of where the strike zone was on the wall, and I had to hit that. And I would, I would try to do like curves and, you know, fastballs and sliders, and and I, you know, I'd, and I would have this whole scenario in my head of of the score and what was happening, and and um, you know, who was bat, up to bat next, and and uh, the whole time I would throw it against the wall, and I would, oh, they got a hit, and I would run and sometimes he'd get past you it'd be a ground ball it'd be a pop-up fly you could sort of I don't know you could kind of like make things happen you know you can make a pop-up fly ball happen by hitting the the uh either hitting the ball on the ground and then hit the wall and then it comes up over you or or vice versa hitting the wall and then onto the ground really hard um line drives right back in your face you know <laughs> 
Uh, I haven't thought about those days in, in a long time, but you know, that, that was a way to, you know, I had sisters, but I, I, I didn't have any brothers growing up. And so, and I had friends, you know, but you, there's plenty of times where you're just by yourself. And, and, uh, I really, I, I really, I think I thrived when I was just by myself, just trying to work through something in my head and, and, uh, kind of making it all up as I went along. So a lot of imagination for that. But uh, yeah, that was my childhood, a lot of that kind of stuff. And and then, you know, that, of course, spilled over into music. When I got into music, um, I would always imagine myself on stage. And what would I do here? What would I do there? You know, and um, and of course, at some point, it, it just turned into it turned into just learning how to play and writing songs and 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 at that point it was just all my time was was spent more on just the the craft of learning how to play and and I wasn't really thinking about the Brian Adams stuff anymore and of course you know we we ended up recovering that song uh Summer 69 on uh, on the cover and you know so like my childhood still spills into MXPX stuff all the time you know, I, you know things I think about in songs that comes out it really does like let's ride is a perfect example of that because you know talks about my first job um you know my first real job from some you know somebody not my parents paying me to do work you know and working for a business that was my first job and it was under the table it was landscaping it was under the table and it was a summer job i was 14 and uh all we wanted to do was skateboard and uh go to the lake pick up girls, that kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, and we did, you know, we did that, but we had, we had, uh, me and my buddy, um, Jeremy, his name was, you know, we had this job and, and we, we had our little summer cash flow going and, uh, you know, that made its way into let's ride. And, um, makes me smile, makes me happy. You know, I love, I love thinking about those good times. You know, at the time it was kind of, it was, uh, I didn't like it. I didn't like work. The work was hard. It was like move all of these, these plastic pots in this giant mountain of a pile. Like I'm talking like, you know, a th two story building tall pile of all these plastic pots and like all these bags of, of beauty bark. And like, we'd have to like move all these things from here and put them over there, stack them over there all nicely to, things like that I'd have to do like all day. Like it was, this is what you're doing all day. And, um, I think, you know, early on I, I did that. And then I got into food service, um, working at, um, a couple different places. One main, the main one was Spiro's pizza and pasta in Silverdale, Washington. And, um, you know, I, I, I worked a few times over in Bremerton, but mainly in the Silverdale place and, uh, met a lot of local guys in the punk rock scene. And that was a big influence on on MXPX as well. Just having that job, that pizza job, because <coughs> well, one, you know, some bad influences, but also some good influences. You know, um, I think I learned. I, just, I heard Pennywise for the first time doing that job. Pennywise, you know, like who's this? This is Pennywise. It was like a, you know, we, they'd play. You know, the cooks would play punk rock cassette tapes on, uh, on you know, on a boombox in the back and so i got introduced to a lot of cool stuff you know i was already into black flag henry rollins the descendants all um quite a few punk bands but uh the you know i was just then discovering like probably green day and and um probably uh i already knew about bad religion in, in i'm sure no effects and rancid but yeah penny and pennywise that was probably all around the same time you know uh, in high school, but, um, yeah, yeah, the, that, that Spiro's pizza and pasta job really, and I was a bus boy and a dishwasher is mainly what I was at some, you know, I, I had graduated almost to being a cook, um, when I, when I stopped working there, but the boss, I had started getting tattooed and I was in the band by the time, I don't know, my second year of Spiro's or something like that. I don't, I don't remember when I started working there, but I, I only worked there from, my 10th and 11th grade year, I think. So I would have kept working, but my boss, so some money had uh, been missing on the nights, some of the nights that I had actually happened to be working. There's some money missing at night. 
It turns out it was the cook. But uh, I was I was accused of it, but not to my face. You know, it was just like, hey, you know what? Uh, let's. And I found this out from a good friend of mine, John Reed, <laughs> who who did the artwork for Renaissance TP. He's a, a swell guy. I love that. Love you, brother. So, uh, but he, you know, we worked together. He was a manager, and I was a, a lowly bus boy. And he gave me a heads up that hey, uh, they kind of think that you're stealing money, and I don't think you are. And he was, t- you know, telling me he he knew me. He knew my character. I was like, yeah, not me, not me. I would never do that. And um. But because of that, the the owner, the boss, took me off the schedule. So he didn't actually fire me. He just took me off the schedule completely and just never put me back on. So that was the, the summer of 1994, um, the summer before senior year of high school. And MX Peaks was going to tour, but Andy could not. Andy Husted could not tour. His parents wouldn't let him. And he was... When we were minors at the time, and and he was a year younger than us, and if we didn't have everybody's parents sign off on touring, um, that wasn't going to happen. So that was a big, honestly, a big, uh, a big reason why he ended up leaving the band, why we kicked him out. But um, that's a whole another story for another time. But um, you know, it was. Uh, those days were crazy. Those days were crazy. So going to high school, those first two years, um, we were almost going to tour, and then we just didn't because we couldn't get Andy to tour. And when I went back to go back to my job, you know, well, we're not touring, so I'm ready to go on the schedule. It was like crickets, you know, nothing. So um, that's when I, I moved over to a different job, Seabeck conference ground and there I have so many crazy stories from that job too but uh you know I think working those jobs really it helped prepare me for touring because touring is a lot of those shenanigans and and a lot of that learning on the fly learning to figure something out and solve a problem really quickly and um I don't think school does that for you school is more of like you know I've learned I learned you know, what sophists are. And I learned like some historical events and, you know, but I I learned plenty in school, but it's a different kind of thing you learn, you know, and, and I think school's changing these days. I I think, um, hopefully, hopefully because, because there's a lot missing, there's a lot of life skills missing in, in, I think public schools or in any school really. And you need those, um, you know, those basic, arithmetic, reading, writing, all that. Of course, you need all that. But once you learn all that, you got to learn how to like, in my opinion, you got to learn how to pay your mortgage, like get a mortgage. How do you, like all these things, how do you get a job? What's, how do you, you know, I know there's like life skill classes you can take and college classes you can take that'll show you how to fill out um, a, a resume for a job. But honestly, that shouldn't be an elective course. That should be part of your your general studies course in school. That's just my opinion. Hey, who am I? Just a bass player. <laughs> but but anyway, all that to say, <clears throat> um, I think a, a lot of, you know, those early jobs, you know, they still make their way into my songs and, and into my I- ideas now and again. Sometimes it's subconsciously. Sometimes it's very consciously. So it just depends on what it is. But um, I just, I hope you guys enjoyed my little uh, blast back to the past. Um, let's, <laughs> and you didn't know I was a baller, a Nerf baller, did you? Raise your hand if you didn't know I was a Nerf baller. Come on. <laughs> I even tried paintballing. That was fun. And and I was on a snowboarding pro team. Like I got sponsored by a pro not a company, not like Pal Peralta or, or I guess it would be Burton if it was snowboarding um, or LibTech or something like that. But um, I was sponsored by, by uh, Kitsap Sports, which was a, a local ski, ski and snowboard shop. And a buddy of mine was the manager. And he was a great snowboarder, Rob. He was our first roadie, roadie Rob. He also uh, signed me up on on the snowboard team so at one point i think my best trick ever on a snowboard was uh my 720 i did a 720 um i think i did it twice and uh 
the second time was much better. But back then we didn't have video or photo or anything like that. When we went out snowboarding, we just went out snowboarding and, and just lived it up and uh, had a great time doing it. But, um, yeah, good times. All right. Um, let's get to voicemails. But before we do that, I had one a thing, a, an online message that's like a voicemail, but it's online. So I'll read that and, uh, and then we'll get to the actual voicemails. So this was from somewhere on one of our, our socials. Hey, Mike, been a fan since the beginning. Live in Port Orchard with my wife and kids. Stay at home, dad, slash punk rock, slash high school baseball coach, slash combat veteran. Thanks for all you do. If you ever have a time in the podcast, I'd love to talk punk rock. Take care. Chris Machias. Thanks for uh, the message, Chris, and thanks for your service. Um, Punk rock. Well, you know what's funny? Last week, we talked a lot about punk rock. I feel like I just talked about punk rock, so this is kind of a... the answer before the question, the question after the answer, but uh, gr- great idea. If we don't, it, we'll talk more about punk rock, I think, um, even through some of these voicemails as well. But, um, you know, like I was saying just a second ago, you know, I uh, I grew up going to punk shows locally. Um, me and my buddy Jeremy, you know, He was the guy that I, you know, was landscaping with back my first job. Um, He was a musician. He was a drummer. And I learned the hard way by not realizing (laughs) drummers are very hard to come by. And uh, there was a local band, Bad Juju. And I went over and I would go watch them practice. They were friends of mine. And I was kind of like, you know, a younger brother kind of character. I'd ride my bike over to their house and and watch their practice. And that really inspired me to start a punk band, you know, just much like a lot of people, you know, you hear some, another punk band and you want to start your own. Well, this was a local punk band. They sounded kind of a cross between like a bad religion with like a miss, uh, a minute men vibe to it because they had some quirkiness to it, but um, really cool stuff, really triumphant towards the end. Like some of their newer later, new, not newer, but like the, their latest stuff that they ever did was really cool. I enjoyed it. But, um, let me go back to the drummer thing. You know, I, uh, I learned the hard way because they were like, their drummer was moving away and I was in practice and they're like, we're looking for another drummer. And I was like, Hey, my friend's a drummer. And he was, he was playing with me. We were going to, we were like literally about to start a band. He might've been the drummer for MXPX or whatever. Right. But I was like, Hey, uh, my friend's a drummer. Duh. Let me uh, bring him over. So <laughs> being the cool guy that I am, I bring him over. I'm like, Jeremy, here's the guys. Bad Juju. Here you go. And he sits down. He starts playing with them, jams it out. He was really good. <clears throat> Long story short, they went on a rampage and were the biggest local band around for years and Jeremy was like a local drummer celebrity. <laughs> and he would like walk around with girls on his arms and like, hey, Mike, what's up? Like, we used to be best friends. But like once he joined that band, we weren't not friends, but it was like he had like a whole new group of cool, cooler friends. You know, I was this little kid and those guys were all a little older. So it was, uh, you know, I always found myself a little bit on the outside. Right. And uh, but at the same time, you know, I was inspired by what the band was doing. So I went through a couple different drummers that I, I was friends with and we'd played with. I tried to start bands with and just, I never could get enough people together or whatever to do it. Well, finally, now this is an origin story for MXPX. Yeah. I, I bet you didn't know that, but, uh, Chris, uh, but, uh, <laughs> I guess we might as well just get to it. But, um, <clears throat> once, uh, I was like, all right, you know what, I'm going to start, I'm going to finally start my own band, you know, because it, because I was starting, I was trying to play with this guy, Don K, and we just couldn't, we couldn't find a, uh, we, just, we just weren't, we weren't clicking completely, and I was just really learning, and didn't know as much as anybody, but I had that drive, and so I was like, okay, I started playing bass, I started playing bass, I'm going to play bass, let's get a guitar player, and I found my best friend, Andy, Andy Husted, and I told him, dude, you're in the band now. Get some guitar lessons. Well, 
get a guitar, then get some guitar lessons. <laughs> so that's how that started. We didn't have a drummer for a long time. You know, Jeremy was still you know, with Bad Juju, and and um, I played with a guy named Jeff Hazen. He was great, but it just we just you know it just it wasn't the right thing. And uh, there was a few others, and and finally, but 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 once I started playing with with Andy Husted, Andy on guitar, he's he's taking lessons every week and he's learning power chords and he's like all right cool enough i'm writing these two chord songs and <clears throat> at one point we had my sister my younger sister come in and hit a snare drum I, I got a snare drum at like a garage sale hit that snare drum like this hit it faster faster oh my god this sounds so good with the dr with one snare drum hit it sounded amazing so right then andy and i are like we have to get a drummer we need a drummer and so that's when i went looking and if you've heard the story you know i called my buddy eric at the time eric buckham <clears throat> who was the, was the, uh, in the cooties uh, the first second guitar player for the cooties. Mm. But anyway, he was like, bro, I started playing guitar. I, I quit the drums. It was too hard or whatever. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know Thomas Nesky. Thomas Nesky played drums uh, at the time, but I didn't know him yet. So uh, Eric told me about Yuri and I called Yuri. He agreed to meet up and the rest is history. But that's punk rock. And uh, <laughs> sometimes you lose a drummer and you gain uh, the absolute best drummer in the world, Yuri Ruli. Let's get to some voicemails. Um, <clears throat> let's do it. Do, do, do. I have not listened to these voicemails, so no idea what, what anybody's going to say. Hey, Mike, how's it going, man? I've been listening to your music for the past 20 years, and I just want to thank you before I said anything else. You know, so many times I could relate to your lyrics with what I was going through, especially with chicks. My friend Ryan introduced MXPX to me back in college in 2002 after bonding over my homemade Nirvana backpack patch. And, you know, since I'm a huge Nirvana fan, I was just wondering, being that you're from the Seattle area, how big of an influence was Nirvana to you? Did you ever see them live or know anyone in the band? Also, where in the hell did you come up with the name MXPX? Back in the day, I used to confuse you guys with no effects all the fucking time. <laughs> anyway, bro, keep on keeping on, and I love your podcast, and I love your music, bro. Thank you. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, <clears throat> what did he want to know? He wanted to know. Just wondering, being that you're from the Seattle area, how big? Oh, the Nirvana. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I already forgot about that. So the Nirvana question uh, is a good question. We, we grew up and we found out about Nirvana. Um, but honestly, by the time I found out about Nirvana, they were already big on the radio. I listened to them. I remember I was in junior high, ninth grade, and I heard Smells Like Teen Spirit over the loudspeaker of, that doesn't make any sense, but my junior high school. And I remember thinking, this is a really weird Metallica song because I was just so used to hearing Metallica and that voice, James Hetfield, eh, and there, no other voice on the radio sounded like that. And then now here comes Kurt Cobain, Nirvana didn't know who they were. I hear that song. I think that's a weird Metallica song, <laughs> but of course, finally found out about them. Definitely, am a huge fan of Nirvana for sure, and was. And uh, how much of an influence were they? I, I don't know. A little bit, you know. I think um, you know we covered a couple of their songs. You know, we just like anybody, we were huge fans of that that first album and and well i guess it's not technically their first album but that's the first album that we knew about was was smells like teen spirit or sorry never mind um but you know at that point you know we started checking out all their early stuff love buzz that kind of stuff um 
didn't know any of them back in the day, didn't see them live um, back in the day. Yuri and Tom saw them live, I think, for in an arena. It was like Monsters of Grunge or something like that. But, uh, you know, by the time they saw them live, it was a big show. It wasn't a, a small club. Although, you know, you know, they did play all the time in small clubs back back early in the days, you know, but we just, the scene in Seattle was so different. It was uh, very segregated uh, age-wise. So if you were underage, you couldn't go see those shows. You had to be 21. But um, nowadays it's a little different. There's a lot more intermingling of ages, all ages. There's a separate bar that you can go to. Think They figured it out. But it was very, um, I don't know, conservative back in those days uh, in the city ordinances, the dance ordinance. But... Uh, we've met Dave Grohl, so technically we have met, uh, you know, a, a member of Nirvana, but, but not when he was in Nirvana. We met him, we met Dave when he was in Foo Fighters, so, re, you know, more recently. Anyway, um, the name MXPX, let's get to that. So we didn't purposely, purposefully name our, ourselves a similar name as NoFX. It just kind of came out that way. Um, Andy Hughes our first guitar player had a big plaid shirt. So it was a, it was a kind of an oversized shirt, but it also had stripes on it in plaid formation, but it was as if the, you took a magnifying glass to a plaid shirt and that's what it looked like. It was all magnified. And so, uh, a friend of ours, Jen Murphy, Jen Murphy, shout out. I haven't seen her in since high school, I think, but, uh, what up, Jen Murphy? She, she came up with that. She goes, that's, that's like your magnified plaid shirt. And when she said magnified plaid, I was like, that's what we're going to call our band, magnified plaid. And so we called ourselves magnified plaid. And then uh, we slowly changed over the years to MXPX. People started calling us MXPX because we'd put MXPX on our flyers because we didn't want to write out magnified plaid. And that's how it is. You know, it, it, funny thing about about no effects. Uh, uh, I'm definitely a fan of no effects. And it's funny, you know, we're friends with them now and, and peers. But back in the early days, you know, when they were just people we didn't know, um, a lot of a lot of jocks were into no effects. And we called them punk rock jocks. And I got into a couple fights with these punk rock jocks over just punk rock clout. Like they didn't like me because I was a punker. I didn't like them because they were jocks, which is so dumb. Uh, I realize that. I mean, for one, I love sports, <laughs> you know, and two, uh, there's nothing wrong with some athlete liking punk rock. So the whole premise of why we were not getting along was dumb. We should have been getting along just on the mere fact that we both loved punk rock. But, you know, kids are kids and they're just going to find something to argue about and to be bitches about, but, uh, <laughs> Hey, we, we live and learn. We've grown. And you know, and it's funny is one of those cats, one of those guys I've definitely hung out with, uh, as an adult and everything's good. Everything's cool. Um, we don't even talk about those days really. We just, there's no need to, there's really no need to, uh, all right. Anyway, let me get to, uh, let me get to one more here. I might have to cut this voicemail episode short. Uh, uh, because I'm talking so much, but uh, we'll do it again. All right, let's get to it. Hey, Mike, this is Jake uh, from South Korea. I'm just calling to say hi, telling you I'm a big fan. I've been a fan of yours for a long time. I first heard you uh, on the uh, Seltzer uh, compilation cassette tape when I was in the ninth grade. Um, it was some Christian compilation that came out. And I, I ended up trading my No Doubt Tragic Kingdom album in the ninth grade with my buddy Mike for your Teenage Politics album. Anyways, um, yeah, so my question for you is really a two-parter. Um, the first question is, uh, what's an artist or band that you love that would really surprise your fans? Like, what's something that you're into that maybe you're a little embarrassed about or whatever um, that would surprise your fans, uh, band or artist? Um, also, one of my favorite things to do is uh, listen to my influences, influences, and I'm wondering if you ever uh, have done that as well. Like, for example, I was a big Blind Melon fan in the early 2000s, and I heard an interview with Shannon Hoon where he's talking about how much he loved the Velvet Underground, 
And at that time, I hadn't really listened to them before. And then I, I became a big Velvet Underground fan because of Blind Melon. So I'm wondering if you've ever done that sort of thing, gone down that type of rabbit hole. Anyways, buddy, I, uh, I love your music. I, I enjoy your podcast. I think you're a great guy. And uh, have a good day. All right. I got to – I can't remember the first part. That would surprise your fans. Okay. Uh, band or artist. All right. I need those reminders. Um, Two-part question. Jake, thanks for calling. Um, you want to know my my guilty pleasures. I can tell you. I can tell you. I think the easiest ones are like Taylor Swift. I love plenty of her songs. Um, Justin Bieber. There's a bunch of really great songs he's released. Um who else? Um, there's not. I mean, there's a bunch. Like at, after that, it's it's very sporadic. I would say like uh, something that would surprise you. Like I really like f- a few songs from like DJ Snake or um, I like uh, I like that song um, "Took a Pill in a Biza by Mike Mike something. Um, you know, there's some weird songs that I like that people would be like. That's not your style. That's weird. But um, then again, I mean, I, I love country music, too. I love country music. I like a lot of artists that you wouldn't think I would like, probably. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. You know, a, a good song is a good song. And, and that's, I think, the bottom line there. All right. Uh, your next part of your question was influences of do I listen to the influences of my influences? I'm sure I have. Yeah, I mean, so l- let's 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 go with what are my influences for punk rock? The Descendants. Um, I, I I definitely feel like I've come up with my own style, but early on, I really liked what they were doing. Excuse me, I really liked what they were doing, and and um. Just the, the fact that they had songs that were really fast and they had songs that were poppy. I liked the diversity there and, and the, the topical diversity. Sometimes it was a real serious song. Sometimes it was a real silly song. So that, that I love those things about The Descendants. So their influences, though, um, would be like Billy Idol, um, would be... Um, would be like Black Flag. I mean, their own band. I mean, Bill Stevenson was a drummer in Black Flag, and you know, but but say like Stephen Edgerton, he he always tells me his one of his favorite bands is Black Flag, which I listened to Black Flag probably about the same time I listened to The Descendants. Didn't know there was a correlation really, but um, that kind of counts, I, I would say. Um, Another one of my influences would be like Elvis Costello. And what is, what's his influences? His influences would be a lot of the old school country people, uh, which I'm definitely a fan of, like Hank Williams and I could go on and on, you know. But um, on, the, on the other side of that, he's into like a lot of jazz and classical. And, and um, I would not say I listen to that stuff. I don't listen to a lot of jazz. I don't listen to much classical. Although, I mean, I like classical, but I just don't listen to it. You know, it's it's it serves a purpose, but um, makes your brain bigger. I should probably be listening to more classical. <laughs> but uh, who? Some. I mean, I'm. I have a lot of influences. I'm sure. I'm sure I have. You know, influences now that that uh, that I don't even realize. But. Um, but yeah, you know, um, bad religion is kind of an influence in in a lot of ways. But they they are a good example of somebody that has they take a lot from from other existing bands and styles and songs in in a way that's not taking they don't take it from their own genre. They take it from seventies glam rock and seventies seventies glam rock, classic rock, and like general just seventies rock and roll. Like so old that their fans don't necessarily well a lot of their fans do but but uh any new fans would never know that their their influence was from this and this and this and this so like like a band called like slate or something is is definitely uh, an influence of bad religion so no i don't listen to those either um 
Maybe I should. I don't know. Um, I think it's just comes down to what's in front of me. What, you know, what, if it's in front of me and I like it, I'll keep listening. If it's in front of me and I don't like it, I'll, I'll of course stop listening or I won't ever listen, but <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's do, let's do one more, one more, uh, one more voice, but that was fun. That was a fun one, Jake. Thanks for calling in. What's up, Mike? I uh, posted this also in the chat, the live chat, but in case you don't see that and you're reviewing the uh, messages, I just want to say I, I honestly, like, I'm stunned that I even caught this. Um, I wanted you personally to know that your album, Life in General, was one of the first, like, few CDs that I actually purchased in regards to my discovery of punk rock music. And uh, it was actually the absolute first album I ever learned from <laughs> cover to cover, so to speak, uh, by ear. I grew up in a really small town in Texas, and I didn't have a lot to do. I had a bass, I had a CD player, and uh, you brought me a lot of comfort throughout those years. And since then, uh, you've been a major inspiration to me, um, as well as Matt Freeman from Rancid, uh, as far as where I branched out, I've, I've been in multiple small local bands within the San Antonio, Texas, Austin, Texas, and uh, Marble Falls, Texas area. But uh, and thank you. You've been a huge inspiration. Thank you. Yeah, man, bass player. Um, I started playing the bass on a classical guitar and I just knew I wanted to play bass. A lot of it was influenced by my mom too, to be honest. My mom was like, Hey, um, you know, sting, sting plays bass and sings. And does my mom sound like that? <laughs> and, uh, so you should too. And, and, you know, it, it didn't hurt that I thought lumpy from, from bad juju going back to my story about the, the local band was, was the bass player. He wasn't the bass player singer, but he was a really cool. He had a cool style. Um, and so that was inspiring. So I started playing bass and, um, early on I, I took bass lessons. I took bass lessons from a guy named Tim Birch at, uh, DJ music, DJ's music in Silverdale, Washington. It's no longer around, but it used to be right there in old town Silverdale. And I learned 12 bar blues. I learned, you know, the names of the strings, the names of the of the notes and the scales and like, okay, this is a major scale. This is a minor scale. This is a chromatic scale. This is a pentatonic scale. Um, you know, it, it may be, have, maybe got a little further than that. Like I learned ninths and I learned some chords a few, a little bit, but mainly it was bass stuff, 12 bar blues, arpeggios. Here's a major arpeggio. Here's a minor arpeggio. Oh, it's a, you know, minor. It means sad. You know, it's like a sad, the sad song, sad chord. Uh, things like that, but um, but he, you know, my my teacher Tim Birch turned me on to to um, what was it? Uh, to Primus, Primus, uh, Sailing the Seas of Cheese. Now that album, for anybody that knows that album, they're gonna be like, oh, it's trippy. It is super trippy. It's nothing like the music that I write, but it was really cool to hear what was what was available out there you know as a bass player like for those that don't know primus is uh known for their i think they're known for their bass playing like because clay lespool is just an amazing bass player he slaps the bass like a seinfeld commercial uh, seinfeld uh transition that kind of thing um but you know their songs are just super out there, super strange. Jerry was a race car driver, big song, big hit song for them. But if you heard it, you'd be like, that's a strange song. If you, if you didn't have any context, uh, you know, but, uh, so anyway, he turned me on to Primus, just like things to check out. If you, you know, if you're listening for bass lines and th that's when I started listening to the red hot chili peppers, uh, mother's milk, um, and so on, you know, it started there, but, um, I learned that, you know, I learned how to play, how to slap a little bit. I learned how to play some, some, uh, some flea bass lines. 
So anyway, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to get to the fact that I think I talked about this already on the podcast, but um, I really was inspired by Brian Ritchie, the the bass player of the Violent Femmes, and he he was such a good bass player. Just listening to his stuff on their albums, on the first album, uh, Blister in the Sun, or yeah, I think that's what it's called, or. I'm not sure what it's called actually, um, but it's got "Blister on the Sun" in the sun in it. That was the record I had. I had it on cassette. That was like really. I thought that was punk rock because because I didn't. Again, I was listening to like Dead Milkman, Descendants, and it was like this punk rock had. There was a lot of different styles, you know. I I knew I knew about the you know the of course I was listening to the Ramones and Sex Pistols and um, and uh, the Clash, but really I was I was really into into this quirky stuff, this different stuff. So, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a wild time, but bass playing the Violent Femmes was was right down my right up my alley and down my alley because the arpeggios I was learning, Brian Ritchie would use a lot of those those stuff that stuff, and and, it, and I think that really that really. I don't know. I, I guess it cemented my bass playing style a little bit because I'd still play that style today. I think I play a little bit more boxy as far as do 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 rather than do 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 do. I mean, I played that stuff like when in the ska stuff, like with Goldfinger. A lot of lot of those arpeggios come into play, like do 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 do. You just have to like be just hit those notes and you can you can pretty much figure it out but yeah violent femmes huge influence on my bass playing and um matt freeman I, i'm not gonna lie he, i love his bass playing he's a great bass player great guy um i went tom and i went and saw rancid play early on a couple different times but early on it was in olympia washington i think i've told the story but we saw them play and just you know it's just inspiring to, as a as a young couple kids you know trying to be in our own band and, and start our own band to to see these bands these punk bands that are kind of at the top of the scene and to to be inspired by that and then to make our way up to the top of the scene with those bands that's amazing too you know we've toured with rancid i don't know how many times a bunch of times over the years um and yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy to kind of look back and go, "Wow, yeah, we've, we've come, we've come a long way." Cheers to that! Cheers to that! All right, you guys, uh, I'm gonna wrap it up. We'll we'll do some more voicemails uh, again another time. You know, I'll save some for next time. Um, but until then, mxpx.com. Thank you guys for for your support. Appreciate it. We got new merch up there, um, and please listen. The best thing you can do is, one, go to mxpeaks.com, sign up for our email list, sign up for our text list, but also just listening to us, add us on Spotify, add us on whatever it is you listen to music on. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, mxpeaks, and then also subscribe to my YouTube channel, My Career Video. Uh, the podcast is uh, coming out on the YouTube regularly. So if you like video instead of just the audio, you can always check it out there. All right, before I go, if you want to leave me a voicemail, if you want to be on the podcast, call me, leave me a voicemail at 360-830-6660. One more time, that's 360-830-6660. All right, shout out to Bob McKnight. Thank you so much for all your help and your support. And um, that's it, you guys. Until next time, peace.